Well, it is good to be with you today. Uh, I will should have grabbed a box of Kleenex to just throw up here in the podium, but uh, it was good to be with you. Good to see who set their clocks the right way this morning. I don't think too many people showed up real early, um, but you could have stayed if you did. Uh, as, we, as we begin today, I just want to begin with some words from Psalm 100. It's a, a psalm of thanks that David writes. He says, Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with celebration. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us. We belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his own pasture. Enter his gates, enter the sanctuary with thanks, enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him, bless his name, because the Lord is good. His loyal love lasts forever. His faithfulness lasts generation after generation. Would you pray with me this morning? God, it is so good to be here today. We are grateful for the extra sleep many of us got last night. God, may it have served to restore our souls, restore our bodies. God, today we give you thanks. We come together to celebrate the work that you are doing in and through and amongst us. So we give today to you, Jesus. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? can't hear anything yet. Hang on. <laughs> there we go. No. There we go. In the darkness we were waiting without hope. mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came away from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for her sake you died Shall not yield, shall not fade. 
by his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. From the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. That's so true, isn't it? Greater things he desires to do here and 
greater things he desires to do in pink knee and greater things he desires to do in our world. Amen? You may be seated for just some moments this morning as we prepare our hearts in a moment for prayer. Uh, just want to bring some things uh, to your way this morning. First of all, just to thank you for Treat Trail, uh, for those who are involved with Treat Trail. Uh, we want to thank you this morning for all of your help with that. Uh, it, it, the weather kind of um, took a turn right at 6 o'clock. It began to rain and get windy, but we still had uh, over 260 people from our community come through, and uh, it was really tremendous. We had great, uh, just great rapport. People really loved it, and we had a chance to serve our community together. It was really good. After being off a year from COVID, um, it was good to, to be able to serve our community in that way. It was a great evening together. Uh, and then um, as well, uh, this morning, uh, I want to just remind the church board that we have church board meeting coming up this Tuesday at 6.30. And, uh, and so as we uh, seek to see God do greater things, uh, we're thankful for Treat Trail. We look forward to doing the, the work of the church together this coming Tuesday night as God continues to lead us. And then uh, we have a new administrative assistant, uh, Stacy Case is our new administrative assistant, and our office hours are Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 9 to 1 as far as the administrative assistant being uh, there. And uh, as well, I think there's a, um, there's a cutoff date for when you need to get information in there as well, and so you'll want to make sure and take note of that this morning. And then thank you for your giving uh, to, the, to the Lord and to his church in these days. Uh, COVID has been a strange kind of situation, and we're so thankful for uh, your giving unto the Lord physically right here in the sanctuary. We use the offering boxes, and then many of you are giving online, and those who are online this morning, we welcome you. We're grateful that you're with us today, and we're grateful for how God continues to be at work in our lives. And then this morning, of course, as all of you know who are here, I'm sure, uh, this is our, our farewell day, our sending off, uh, launching Pastor Joe and Maria uh, into this new work, uh, into a new city, the city of Pinckney, uh, as they begin to, to birth through the Lord's strength and help the Pinckney Community Church of the Nazarene. So we're going to have a meal. You can tell we have tables set up here this morning following, and uh, we'll give you instructions on that at the end, uh, how we'll kind of serve and all that. But we hope you can stay this morning for that time, and it'll be a, a precious time for us. Uh, we'll hear some, um, some thank yous uh, from, I think, our teens during that time, and that'll be exciting. They've, they've kind of videotaped some thank yous, so stay around for that. We look forward to that moment together this morning. And, and then uh, this morning, I, I'd like to ask if... Um, if Doreen Ahern would stand, I know she has a rough time with her knees, uh, but I'm going to ask Doreen if she would, if she, can you stand? Are you able to stand? All right, you, yes, you are. You walked in, so you can stand. I don't know if you can come up here. Can you do that? All right. Um, I, uh, anyway, uh, I just want to be sensitive to the fact she's been struggling with the knees these days, but um, as you, many of you know, Doreen has served as our treasurer for uh, how many years? Do you... 17 years. 17 years serving as our treasurer. And I don't know, how many of you, anybody here been a treasurer of a church before? Yeah. Uh, there, are, there is a lot to it. And um, Doreen has served with, with excellence when it comes to being our treasurer. Uh, Doreen will be with us for a while longer. And so this isn't the final Sunday for Doreen to be with us, uh, and she's continuing to serve us as treasurer through these coming months for uh, however, whatever, whenever the Lord would see to it that we would make transition. Uh, but she will be going uh, to be a part of the church plant as well and be a, a support in that and be a part of it. And we're grateful that we can uh, send her as well. This morning, we would like to give Doreen the Distinguished Service Award with Fenton Church of the Nazarene. I'm going to read this so that you all know what it says. Uh, Distinguished Service Award, Fenton Church of the Nazarene, takes pleasure in presenting this certificate to Doreen Ahern. With our deepest gratitude and appreciation, we thank you. Your many years of faithful dedication and loving service as treasurer for the Fenton Church of the Nazarene have been a great blessing and reflection of Christ for us all. 
And Doreen, we're so grateful and we're so thankful for you today. And we want to give you this card as well as a token of our appreciation. And I, I'll, I'm going to get these out, uh, for you and also these flowers. Maybe uh, Pastor Joe could come up and help carry the, the flowers. But could, would you just give uh, Doreen uh, just uh, our appreciation today and our thanks today? I'll give those to, to Joe. And, um, and I would, as we move into, into our prayer time this morning, um, I'm glad Doreen's up close because I'd love to have us have prayer kind of over her as well. At the end of the service, uh, we're going to have a time um, of, of farewell and uh, moments uh, with Pastor Joe and Maria and their family. Um, but we kind of kind of wanted to separate that out a little bit because of today, uh, there's kind of different ways in which we're sending and ways in which we're giving appreciation. And so Doreen would love to pray over you today uh, as well as we go into our time of prayer. As we pray this morning, how many have a praise to bring to the Lord today? At the very least, thanking the Lord for Pastor Joe and Maria and their children and Doreen, right? We have a lot to, I mean, a lot to praise the Lord for. How many have a need to bring to the Lord this morning? We, we all have needs. We need his sufficient and sustaining grace today. And would you be in prayer for Marty Schaus, especially? Marty, I talked to him yesterday, and, um, and he is finally starting to do a little better. Um, he had a fairly routine back surgery, supposedly routine, uh, but they had to do more than they thought and then kind of uh, nicked the area where it allowed spinal fluid to, to um, leak. And so he ended up with a terrible headache and all kinds of things that result from that until it kind of seals up. But he's starting to do better and we're thankful for that. Being prayer for Sue Fleming, uh, Jerry and Sue aren't with us this morning because Sue is at home recovering from a knee replacement surgery. She's doing well, so thank God for that. Uh, be in prayer for, for Sue. And then this morning, um, we obviously uh, also, as, as you see the insert, want to be in prayer for the persecuted church. Um, this is the International Day of Prayer for the pers per persecuted Christians around the world. If you would just be in prayer, we may never know their names, but there are people who are going through great suffering and have great need. And then, of course, today, we pray for Pastor Joe and Maria and for Lydia and for Ian and Elizabeth and Abigail. I said Lydia first because I left her off the list one time and didn't mean to do that. Um, but, uh, but anyway, we want to pray for them this morning as well. So would you stand with me as we pray together today, as we come to the Lord this morning? And I'm, I know there are many more requests and needs than what we've listed and many more praises, but let's pray. Would you enter into prayer with me today? Father, we, we give you praise today. And we give you thanks, Father, that we can come into this place of worship, that you, that you call us into worship. You call us to put you at the center of our lives. And this, this what we might call routine of coming to worship, this, this moment of coming together as the body is not insignificant. It's a moment in which we declare that you are the center of not only our, the universe, but the center of our lives center of our homes, the center of your church, your, and you desire to be the center of our cities, our communities. You, you desire to do greater things within the communities in which we live, in the Fenton area. We're thankful for the tree trail, and we're thankful for the lives that have been touched and been impacted by that. We're, we're thankful, Father, that we could serve the community in a way that would reflect your love on that evening. Uh, we're thankful, Father, today that, that as we prepare to launch and send Joe and Maria and their children and, and Doreen as, as, as you would lead, that, that, Father, you want to do your work in communities in which there needs to be more and more of your kingdom presence, more of your presence, Jesus. People drawn to you in unmistakable ways. And so, Father, we give you thanks today for how you're at work in all of this. And, and, Father, we would pray for the needs, especially today, of your church and of the world around us. We pray for Marty Schaus. We're thankful to hear that he's beginning to turn the corner. And we pray that you would strengthen him and heal him completely. And that you would bring restoration and, and renewal for he and for Becky and for Sarah these days. 
We pray for Sue Fleming. We give you thanks that, that you have helped her to come through the operation so well and that she's recovering well. But we pray for your continued healing. And we pray, Father, for the rehabilitation process to just help her to get full use of that knee once again very soon. Father, we pray today for every single hand that was uplifted, for every single need. You know each one today by name. You know each one of our hearts today, and we lift to you every need, knowing you're more than able to meet us according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus in the midst of our need. And then, Father, today we, uh, we, we would just pray for the persecuted church. We we pray, Father, for those around the world who are suffering and struggling and many who cannot worship freely like we are this morning without threat. We pray, Father, for those who are in countries in which to, to, to be baptized or to worship on a Sunday morning literally could cost them their lives. Those who are experiencing persecution in maybe ways that aren't quite as severe as that as well need our prayers. And we pray for all of the persecuted church today. You know the names. You know the places. We could never list them all this morning. But, Father, you know, and we pray for your empowering spirit to be at work, for them to be true witnesses of your peace and grace and truth in the midst of hostility. Father, today as we continue in this service, we we pray for Pastor Joe and Maria and their family, and we'll pray for them a little later on as well. But we pray that you would send them in your power, in your presence and spirit. Father, today, as as we continue our prayer and as we come to the conclusion of it, we pray for Doreen. And we lift our hands out towards her today. Would you do that with me? Just lift your hands out towards Doreen today. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for for your faithfulness in her life, for your grace in her life. It's enabled her to to do among us what she has done, for it surely has taken your grace and your faithfulness for her to serve as treasurer all these years and to keep that sweet spirit that she has, and we're so thankful for it. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless her and that today that she would sense your affirming presence in her life. And, Lord, that as you so lead in the future, and we know you'll, you, you'll work in it all, the, the time of, of moving fully into the church plants in greater ways will come and we just pray that you just give confirmation and timing to all of that and father we give you thanks today we thank you for servanthood we thank you for faithfulness but most of all father today we thank you for your faithfulness and your your heart for us and how you love us and so we pray that you would be exalted today as we continue to worship and you would anoint pastor joe as he preaches this morning as he shares his final message as a staff pastor here we pray father that it would it would speak to our hearts and we would hear your voice and we would respond and we give you all the praise for how you're going to work in these moments in jesus name and all god's people said amen you may you well stay standing or okay remain standing
mountain's path Reaching the near and far No force of hell can stop Your beauty changing hearts You made us for much more than this Awake the kingdom seen in us Fill us with the strength and love of Christ We are your church Pastors had walk-up songs like uh, baseball players did when they go to the plate. That would that'd be one of mine. Uh, kids, if there's kids' church this morning, uh, you are dismissed. Kind of looking at Steve. I don't. Um, but it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, today we are continuing in our multiplied series, and I guess to be completely honest with you. Um, I really struggled with how to start this message. Uh, Maria, Pastor Ron, can laugh because all, all week I felt like, I said, man, I'm just, I'm struggling with this one a lot. Uh, I, would, I would type words out, I'd read them, I'd delete them, I'd type more out, I'd reread it, delete it, and just all week kept happening and happening. And, and each time just writing stuff out, just being reminded of the, the many wonderful memories that have taken place here over the past five years, just reflecting on how each of you has impacted me, impacted our family, and just feeling grateful, too, for the opportunity to, to come back home to Linden Fenton area uh, to serve in ministry. And, and the more I reflected on this, um, thinking of all of the, the lasts that have taken place in our lives over the past three to four months, I was reminded of an illustration that I heard in seminary during a midweek chapel. And our seminary president, Dr. Joseph Stoll, he, he compared the journey of life to that of a journey a, a train takes down the tracks. When, when we are born, we step onto the train for the first time. And we find when we get on the train, we are not alone. Our parents are there, our grandparents are there, extended family, they're all there ready to receive us onto the train. But as we go through different seasons of life, we, we get to different stations along the tracks. And different people get on the train and different people get off the train, elementary school, high school, college, first job, so on so forth. And, and so for us, this morning represents our, our final moments, it will say, at, at platform 11075. It's just the address here, uh, as creative as I could get. Um, but it's our final moments here at FCN. And as, as Ian would remind us, if he were up here with me this morning, uh, the, the hopper of the, the train car has been restocked with coal, and the tank has been filled with water, and steam is beginning to hiss and eke its way out of any cracks as the pressure in the building, in the engine is building, and the train is preparing to depart. And even though our, our train will soon be leaving the FCN station, we'll never forget our time here, the, the friendships that we have formed and how God was at work and continues to be at work amongst us. It'd be nice just to stop there and okay, we go. But, 
We continue, and, and, and if there was a New Testament writer who kind of knew the feeling of relocating and moving from place to place to place, it'd be the Apostle Paul. He, he made three different trips around the Mediterranean region in the middle of the first century, and that was without trains, without cars, on foot, camel, horse, whatever you could find, boat. And then he made a fourth trip that many believe took him as far as Spain. A lot of traveling. And this morning, as we continue in our multiplied series, we're going to focus in on one of the places that Paul visited during his second and his third missionary journeys. It's the, the city, the town of Thessalonica. And what's really cool about Paul's letter, the first Thessalonians, is that it's one of the earliest New Testament manuscripts that we have on hand, that archaeologists have recovered and dated back. It is from when it was written to, to when these events happened, like it's the shortest. Span. So it gives us a, a really unique picture into the life of the early church. We get a, an early glimpse, an early snapshot of what life was like for early Christians in the church in its infancy. infancy. And so if you're able, would you stand with me one last time as we read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul begins in verse 1. As you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, our visit with you wasn't a waste of time. On the contrary, we had the courage through God to speak God's good news in spite of a lot of opposition, although we had already suffered and were publicly insulted in Philippi, as you know. And just a little bit of background information here, this, this opposition that Paul is speaking about here in verse 2, and we can find that over in Acts chapter 17. Luke traveled with them and kind of was making notes and detailing the journey, but we see that Paul was, was in Thessalonica for around three weeks, and he was proclaiming the gospel. He was proclaiming that Jesus was king, not Caesar. Um, but in his time there, as was so often his time in different cities, Mobs formed, and, and they rioted against Paul, and they attacked the house that the believers were meeting in, and they, they dragged the house owner, and they dragged others out into the streets before the city leaders, accusing them. And, and, and so Paul and, and some of his uh, company that he was traveling with, they, they sneak away in the middle of the night to go down the road to the next town. So that's some of the opposition uh, that Paul is talking about there. He continues, in verse 3, he says, Our appeal isn't based on false information, the wrong motives, or deception. Rather, we have been examined and approved by God to be trusted with the good news, and that's exactly how we speak. We aren't trying to please people, but we are trying to please God, who continues to examine our hearts. As you know, we never used flattery, and God is our witness that we didn't have greedy motives. We didn't ask for special treatment from people, not from you or from others, although we could have thrown our weight around as Christ's apostles, it said we were gentle with you like a nursing mother caring for her own children. And this verse here, I have just come to love over the past couple months. We were glad to share not only God's good news with you, but also our very lives because we cared for you so much. You remember, brothers and sisters, our efforts and hard work. We preached God's good news to you while we worked night and day so we wouldn't be a burden for any of you. You and God are witnesses of how holy, just, and blameless we were toward you, believers. Likewise, we know that how you treated each of you, you know how we treated each of you like a father treats his own children. We appealed to you, encouraged you, and pleaded with you to live lives worthy of the God who is calling you into his own kingdom and glory. We also thank God constantly for this. When you accepted God's word that you heard from us, you welcomed it for what it truly is. Instead of accepting it as a human message, you accepted it as God's message. And it continues to work in you who are believers. Brothers and sisters, you became imitators of the churches of God in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. You say, thanks be to God. You pray with me. God, as we enter into this passage and enter into the life of the church in, in Thessalonica and just Paul's relationship with them. And, and as we just think about how you are calling us to, to serve and to multiply here in the area, God, would you open our eyes and ears to the wonders and beauty of your word? Would you speak to us? Open our hearts to be transformed by your spirit this morning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And you can have a seat. 
Well, if, if you were to take out your phone right now, and you, you don't have to do this, but if you were going to do this, uh, I won't say who I see on their phone right now, but you can head over to FentonNazarene.com, click on our mission and core values page, and the very first core value that you would see is this, missional community. Jesus sent and sends God's people out to the ends of the earth to share the incredible news of the gospel. Therefore, we collectively give of ourselves to see our communities, workplaces, schools, and homes transformed through the movement of the Holy Spirit. When we think about multiplied communities, it begins with this. It begins with the recognition that multiplied communities are established, empowered, and entrusted by God. Jesus sent and still sends today God's people out to the ends of the earth to share the incredible news that is the gospel. If we look back real quick to, to verses three and four, we see that Paul kind of has to reestablish this reality with the Th Thessalonians. He says our, our appeal isn't, isn't based on false information. It's not based on wrong motives or deception, but we have been examined. We have been approved by God to be trusted with the good news. And that's exactly how we speak. We're not trying to please people, but we're trying to please God who continues to examine our hearts. He goes on to say that they didn't try to, they didn't try to woo the Thessalonians using fancy words. They weren't motivated by greed. They weren't seeking selfish gain like a lot of traveling teachers of the day were doing. They weren't about promoting themselves. They, they weren't about their personal platforms, but they had been entrusted with a divine mission. Jesus, the King of Kings, had sent them out with good news for his entire realm. In another letter to a different early church community, Paul phrases it this way. He says, this is the confidence that we have through Christ in the presence of God. It isn't that we ourselves are qualified to claim anything came from us. No, our qualification is from God. He has qualified us as ministers of a new covenant, not based on what is written, but on the Spirit. Paul wants to make it clear that their calling, their, their presence in Thessalonica, their journey around the entire Mediterranean region, isn't just because they thought, hey, this would be a really cool thing to do. Hey, we can, we can build our brand. We can establish our brand. We can, you know, let's, okay, how are we gonna get this all out there? It's not about them becoming the greatest first century teachers and proclaimers of the gospel. But they speak and act to bring glory to God. They speak and act to share of the good news of the gospel. They know that God has empowered them and entrusted them to establish new kingdom communities. And I think it just begs us to ask the question, like what, what are our motivations for sharing the good news of the gospel? I think for many of us, when, when we read of the travels and the experiences of people like Paul, we think, oh, that's great, God. But I, I could never do anything like that. That's, that's not me. I know for me, I, I felt that way for a long time. God, you know, you know I'm an introvert. You made me that way. Uh, God, I can't just preach from sticky notes and a bare bones outline. Uh, God, I, I'm not anyone special. I'm just an average Joe. Um, maybe, maybe you have felt similarly. But the reality when we open the scriptures is that we see that this divine commission, it's not just for a, a select few men and women and children. It's for all of us. And, and while we may not feel prepared for it, as Pastor Ron reminded us last week, the, the God who calls us is the very same God who qualifies us for the task. He has filled us with the fullness of his Holy Spirit. I don't have it on a slide, but we read last week from Ephesians chapter three where Paul says that we might know the love of Christ that is beyond measure and be filled entirely, filled completely, filled holy with the fullness of God. And as we turn the pages of scripture, we see time and time again, God calling his people to go out and multiply into many kingdom communities. From the, from the moment humanity enters the scene in Genesis 1, God says, go, 
fill the earth. Establish communities that reflect my image. Take the fullness of heaven with you as you go. And we read of men and women who are fueled by a vision not only to see God come to us, but also heaven come to earth. They and we want to see God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we partner with God in seeing faith communities multiplied, we we can take confidence, we can have confidence, even if we don't feel entirely qualified, because we know that God is the one who establishes. It's not our kingdom, it's his kingdom. We know that God is the one who empowers. It's not by our own strength, it's by his. And we know that it is God who's the one who entrusts. It's not us trying to prove ourselves, it's just us living out who he has created us to be. As we continue through our passage, we see that multiplied communities live out the gospel in both word and action. If we were to go back to our, our core value there for just a second, you'd notice that we, we didn't write, we proclaim the gospel and move on. But we were intentional to write that we give of ourselves. Sometimes, yes, we are called to, to speak a quick word to someone else, but more times than not, God wants us to get to know those we walk through life with. The God who came to dwell amongst us is the same God who calls us to dwell amongst others. In verse eight, we we see that this is so much more than saying the right words for Paul. It's not just saying the right words at the right time. I apologize, it's a little small up there. But he, he says in the translation we read from, it says, we were glad to share not only God's good news with you, but also our very lives because we cared for you so much. And I love the, the way the NRSV just translates that. It really, it gets to the heart of the emotion that Paul is writing with, that Paul is living with. He says, so deeply do we care for you. We're determined to share not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Why? Because you have become very dear to us. I love Paul's language here. And the picture it presents for us about the role of the church. More than just trying to fill buildings on a weekly basis, Paul paints for us a picture of living rooms full, of meals simmering in the slow cooker, of life events being walked through together. Maybe instead of the the slogan, the the motto, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there, we we could and maybe we should rephrase it, like a good neighbor, the church is there. And by church, I don't mean in church as in how we're we're gathered here this morning, but, but church as in us, as me, you, our family units, our community groups, being these microcosms of the kingdom in the world around us. But we can only get there by, one, we, we got to know who our neighbors are, know their names, how many people are in their family, do they have any pets? And we need to deeply care for them and strive to earnestly seek the best for them. And yes, sometimes that means it's people we don't get along with and people we don't agree with. But remember, Paul is writing this after experiencing rioting mobs and getting forced out of town and so much more. The idea of loving your neighbor, it's evident all throughout scripture from the commands in Exodus and Leviticus to to love the stranger and foreigner who live among you and to, to leave some of your crops unharvested so the poor in the community can go get food to eat to the midst of exile, when when God's people, they've been conquered and uprooted and they've been trafficked across the Middle East to Babylon and God's word to them is not just retreat and hole up and and don't engage, but instead, he says this, he says, build houses and settle down. Cultivate gardens, eat what they produce. You're, You're gonna be there a while. Get married, have children. Promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for that city. And again, in the New Testament, we, we know the great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And in the earliest days of the church, we find that the church is being described as a community that is living out the gospel in both word and deed. 
in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4, we, we catch these glimpses of these early faith communities, and, and they're being described as, as, as through breaking bread together. They're sharing meals together. They're praying together. They're worshiping together. They're meeting each other's needs. They're bearing the good news of the gospel with words and actions. As I was packing up some of the items in my office this week, I came across a sticky note where I had written the last few lines of a poem by Gerald Manley Hopkins. The poem's called As Kingfishers Catch Fire. And throughout the poem, he's, he's describing the people of God at work in sharing the good news of the gospel in word and action. And he writes this at the end of the, at the, end of the poem. He says, for Christ plays in, in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. Meaning through our hands and feet, through our bodies at work. To the Father, through the feature of men, you say, and women and children's faces. God at work amongst us. God at work in us. God at work through us. And so, yes, share the good news of the gospel with your neighbor. But also share with them your family's award-winning pumpkin pie recipe. If you have one of those, you can share that with us as well. Share with them backyard barbecues. Share with them sporting events and birthdays. Share with them in times of celebration. And share with them in times of mourning. Share with them the gospel in word and action. As we move to the end of our passage, we see that multiplied communities multiply others. This is the great commission lived out. As we go through life, Jesus expects us to make disciples, to baptize men and women and children into his name and into his kingdom, and to teach others about his life and death and resurrection. We are called to be a part of faith communities that multiply others. Paul encourages the Thessalonians in verse 14 at the very end of our passage there. He says that you, you've accepted and responded to the gospel message. You are becoming imitators of all the early churches back over in Judea. If we were to back up a few verses to, to chapter 1, Paul, and we'll have the verses here in just a moment, but I imagine he's, he's writing this as a father, just maybe having like tear-filled eyes, a proud father watching his kids grow up, actually listening to, to what he has said, and they're doing this, and he writes that you became imitators of us and of the Lord. When you accepted the message that came from the Holy Spirit with joy in spite of great suffering. So as a result, you became an example to all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The message about the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. The good news about your faithfulness to God has spread so that we don't even need to mention it. Paul said, you, you guys are putting us out of a job. Why? We don't need to travel around anymore. You are going from place to place to place, testifying to the gospel. You guys are multiplying. People around the region know Jesus because of you. And Paul encourages their multiplication. And he reminds them that they're not alone in the journey, but they're a part of a movement that's already spread throughout a vast majority of the Roman Empire, the, the Roman Empire that was at that time seeking to oppress them and persecute them and put them up on crosses and all sorts of brutal things. Their story is a continuation of the story that began hundreds of years earlier when, when Abraham received the call to go from Ur down to Canaan, to be a blessing to the nations, to bring the presence of God with him and Sarah into the communities in which they would inhabit. And we find ourselves here this morning, thousands of years later, living out that same story. We are called to multiply communities, to see heaven come to earth in little pockets wherever we go, whether it's Linden or Fenton or Holly or Pinckney, taking with us the, the fullness of the presence of God that dwells within us, that we might bear its light as we step off the train to the different platforms and stations that life brings our way. For us, yeah, Ian heard the word train. He's like, where's the train at? 
For us, the next stop of the train is Pinckney. And seeing heaven come to earth through the life of Pinckney Community Church of the Nazarene. We'll just shorten it to Pinckney Community Church there. And over the next few months, we're going to be intentionally surrounding ourselves with a team of, of, of local missionaries, we'll say, who have the same heart, the same desire to see heaven come to earth in the greater Pinckney area. And our mission at the church is simple in some ways. It's that we want to see the kingdom of heaven come to earth in Pinckney by inspiring others to follow Jesus with open hearts, open hands, and open homes. And by open hearts, I mean that our hearts are open to God and to one another. Because we know, we believe that, that God is constantly at work growing and sanctifying us. He's refining our hearts to shape us and to reflect his image into the world around us. And so it's essential for our hearts to remain open, that we might see and hear the work God desires to do in us and through us. By open hands, I mean that our hands are open to serve the communities and creation that surround us. Jesus modeled that everything we have is a gift graciously given to us by God to be used for his glory. And so we commit to give generously of ourselves using some of that same language, uh, integrating our faith, our life, our vocations, serving and partnering with Jesus to bring about flourishing lives locally and globally. And by open homes, I mean that our homes are open for us to share our lives with people who are not yet part of our community. We want our homes to be open as places of rest and refreshment, fun and fellowship. And we strive to posture ourselves as hospitable neighbors to seek the welfare of those we share life with. And so as we follow Jesus' example and we follow Jesus' leading, we too ensure that everyone is welcome into our home and into our lives. And so for us, we're, we're not going to be gathering as we traditionally envision churches gathering. But our gatherings are going to be centered upon mission to the community. It's our vision to have two to three of these communities on mission established by our goal launch date in early February of 2022. These communities will, will meet twice a month for, for spiritual formation, for Bible study, discipleship, prayer, some worship. And they'll meet twice a month for mission, serving regularly at location within the community. And on Sunday nights, we'll have our worship gatherings, sharing meals together, celebrating the ways that God is bringing heaven to earth. In my long-term dream, and this goes all the way back to where this journey started at Urbana 2018, probably December 28th or 29th of 2018, over in St. Louis. Um, I, I still have it. I can sh if you want to look in the prayer journal after service, it's there. It's a coffee shop church in Europe. Uh, Hamburg's a European city name, so maybe it's close enough there. Um, but my long-term dream I think the, the vision of this church plant is to find a building in town that'll serve as a gathering place for the community, a place where lives can be shared, a place where good coffee and tea and pastries and sandwiches can be consumed, a place where students can hang out after school, where, where parents can get that quick cup of caffeine after dropping the kids off at school, a place where local talents can be highlighted, a place where heaven will dwell on earth, a place that is Abigail so beautifully drew, a place that's a cafe for all. So as we wrap up this morning, I want us to, to come back to the song, Build Your Kingdom Here. And I know that we, we sang the song a couple times last week, we're singing it again this morning. Um, but if there was one song, and I told Pastor Ron this this week, if there was one song that I wanted to sing on our final Sunday here, it was this song. Not just because it's like my favorite song and kind of our family's favorite song, um, but because the song is more or less the, the anthem 
we are taking with us as we begin to plant Pinckney Community Church. If you paid attention to the lyrics, it was build your kingdom here. It's proclaiming Jesus, bring heaven to earth. Increase in us, Jesus, we pray. Unveil why we're made, why you have created us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives because you are our joy and our prize. To see the captives' hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor, at peace, experiencing the fullness of God's shalom and presence. And so we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We move to a house that has had project after project after project needing to be done for heaven's cause. Thank you so much. And the song continues, unleash your kingdom's power. Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts because you have made us for so much more than this. So Jesus, awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Would you pray with me? God, we are so thankful for today. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the people and places around us where you are calling us to go out and multiply. Give us the boldness, give us the confidence to live out the gospel in word and action. May we be reminded you've created us for this. You have filled us with the fullness of your spirit. So God, may we go out from here with the good news that you are transforming lives. You are restoring communities. God, give us the vision to see what it would look like for heaven to come to earth where we are. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And would you stand and sing with us this morning?
So as I, as we uh, prepare and I guess begin to say farewell, as we think about what it means to see communities multiplied both here in Fenton and down south in Pinckney, I just want to end this morning with Paul's words to the Thessalonians, starting at the end of the letter in chapter 5, where, where he writes to comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong, but always pursue the good for each other and everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in every situation because this is God's good will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't suppress the spirit. Don't brush off spirit-inspired messages, but examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. Avoid every kind of evil. And now may the God of peace himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at our Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this. Well, you can have a seat, and if you are tuning in online, I've been instructed to tell you to keep tuning in for a few more minutes here, but you can have a seat this morning. Thank you, Pastor Joe, for just uh, a wonderful message this morning. Amen. Thank the Lord for that message. We have a, a video, I think, that we're ready to, ready to go, guys. Uh, we have a video we want to show um, this morning um, that uh, just kind of uh, hopefully gives us a little rem remembrance and celebrate, celebration of Pastor Joe and Maria's ministry among us, and uh, I think I'm... We're good. We're ready to roll. So here we go. And, and prepare for the meal together as well. So so here, here we go.
I'm going to ask my wife, <clears throat> my wife if she would come. And I'd like to ask if, uh, if Pastor Joe and Maria would come and their kids would come uh, with them at this moment. And uh, we just want to, we really want to thank them this morning. Uh, and this meal following will be a time of appreciation for them and a time for you to celebrate with them and maybe share some thanks and some memories with them. But um, it takes a team. Leslie and I know that. And... Um, we want to just thank not only Joe, but Maria t today. And, of course, Maria served as our administrative assistant for quite a while, and we're thankful for that. But we'd like to give some flowers to her. I, don't, I think she would like those better than Joe, possibly. And so um, this morning, um, we'd love to extend our appreciation to you, Maria, as uh, we give these flowers. And then uh, for Pastor Joe, uh, there's some different ways in which I have felt led to express uh, appreciation to him just between he and I. Uh, but uh, there was one book, he loves books, and uh, uh, if you don't know that by now, then you haven't spent much time around him. Um, but uh, one of the persons I've really appreciated throughout my ministry is Eugene Peterson. He's been a mentor to me, and I know Joe enjoys Eugene Peterson's work as well. And there's a, a newer book out. It's called Letters to a Young Pastor, Timothy Conversations Between Father and Son. It's actually uh, it's Eugene Peterson's letters to his son, Eric. Eugene Peterson planted his church many, many, well, years ago. He's now deceased. And his son, Eric, also planted a church. And these are Eugene Peterson's letters to his son as he planted his church over the years. And I thought that would be something that Hopefully it would be encouraging and wisdom that would be of help to you. And uh, I've never planted a church. And Joe and I have had a lot of conversations. And, and hopefully uh, he's learned from the good things and may, the, the things that maybe I've made mistakes in. He's learned from those. But I could never teach the things that probably Eugene Peterson is writing to his son. So, Joe, uh, thank you so much for your partnership. It's, a, it's a, a huge partnership. And it's, uh, it's, gonna, it's hard to even sum it up into words. And um, I just thank God for that partnership with, with Pastor Joe. It's been a highlight of my ministry. And then finally, uh, we wanted to give this as a token of our appreciation as a congregation. And you can open up that, that, open, open that later and read it. And um, there's a gift in there for you from, uh, from us as a congregation. And as well this morning, back uh, there on that little table, you see cards for Pastor Joe and Maria. And that's for you to place a card in of appreciation. We kind of encourage you to, to give gift cards if, if possible, but maybe some of you have different ways of expressing your love and appreciation, and that's great as well. And we're so grateful. We're so glad that you're here for this time. This is a bittersweet moment. I am so excited about what God's going to do in multiplying communities uh, in Pinckney. I'm excited about what he'll do here among us. And so... Um, Next week, come back. We're going to begin talking more about what it means to multiply together. But we're so grateful uh, for what God has done. And let's just, um, let's just give a great, uh, a great appreciation moment for them. Would you stand and would you just, uh, would you just give them a, your appreciation today, your thanks today? Just one, one last thing, you know, associate pastors average about two years, and Pastor Joe and Maria have been here for five years. It's a great, great stay in the life of God's church. I'd like to end one, with one more thing before we eat. This will serve as the, the, the prayer for the meal as well. And just to give you some instruction, you'll go through the door over by the sound booth, and you'll go through and uh, get your food. There's, um, there's prepackaged food kind of meal for you and I think a dessert and then you can come back there's I think drinks out in the foyer there and you can come back in and find your seat and have a time of fellowship and be sure to uh, come up to Joe and Maria and share your thanks and appreciation I'm sure you'll do that afterwards um, if you would just merely place your 
uh, garbage into a, the, a garbage can. That would be great uh, on the way out. I don't see it yet, but we'll, we'll put one there. Oh, there we go. It's up here. And there's one back there by the sound booth. Uh, but we will not tear down. That's going to be done by the team that set everything up. So once you're done and you place your garbage in, um, then you can, you're free to leave. Well, let, we're going to have prayer, and I'm going to ask Joe, Maria, and the kids if they would just uh, maybe uh, move to the front of the edge of the stage. I'm going to pray from behind them, ask Leslie to join me if she would. And I'm going to ask today if you would just stretch your hands out towards them, and we're going to pray over them today, a prayer of God's, uh, for God's sending and for God's blessing uh, this morning. And so would you do that? So let's just all place our hands out. And let's, uh, let's pray for them together today. And I'm going to ask Leslie if she would help me to put, we're going to represent you and put our hands upon them today. Father, uh, we, we give you praise and great thanks for Pastor Joe and Maria and for Lydia and for Ian and Elizabeth and Abigail. We're so grateful for their lives and for them uh, being among us, doing life with us, but also ministering among us and ministering to us. And we're so grateful for it today. We could never sum it up in, in a matter of words or even gifts today, what it means. And we're so thankful, Father, that, that you've done multiplication in this community. You've impacted people within the life of this community because Pastor and Joe have come and, and uh, Pastor Joe and Maria have come among us. Father, we pray that as they are sent to Pinckney, that you would continue to multiply, do your work. We know it's going to be hard work, but we know that you'll empower them and strengthen them and walk with them all the way. And we're praying, Father, for your kingdom to come, not only here in Fenton in the coming days and in Linden and in the surrounding area, but we're praying for your kingdom to become very present in the Pinckney area because of this new work. We pray that you'll set captives free because of it, that you'll heal, heal the streets and lands of, of Pinckney in that area because of it, that you'll do your work, of uh, Father, of redemption and reconciliation, and, Father, that, that uh, you would be glorified in all that's done. We give you praise. We're going to miss them so dearly, Lord. They won't be real far away, but we're still going to miss them being in the life of the body every week. But we pray, Lord, because of their, their willingness to, to go, that you, Father, would um, bless it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. One last word. Joe, uh, as you were sharing, I couldn't help, and I should have shared it before I prayed. It's 2018. I think there was a picture up there, I think maybe at Urbana. I'm not sure on the video. But 2018, uh, you came and talked to me after that time at Urbana. And I tell you what, it's been amazing to watch the progress of that vision develop all the way up to where you've been going through communities on mission training. And I think if it would have been any other timing, I'm not so sure. It, it's just amazing to me how that all has come together. And when I watched you share the vision, it's actually, it's actually come into its fullness in this time. The timing is right, and we praise God. So let's eat together, let's fellowship together, and uh, let's enjoy celebrating, and let's have a few tears and laughs along the way. Oh, and my wife reminded me, some etiquette, Joe and Maria will go first, uh, and whichever child wants to head the way, I have no idea. <laughs> so let's allow Joe and Maria and their family and Doreen to go first. Let's allow them to go first today.